We're continuing our study in the book of Acts. And we come this morning to a new chapter, chapter 17. We're going to be focusing on verses 1 to 15. You can use one of our pew Bibles. You can find the text printed in your take home. We'll also have the words on the screen. So let's hear the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Luke writes, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I've said to you on many times, I've recited for you that quote from G.K. Chesterton, a memorable saying where he said that Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. I don't know if he came to that conclusion while reading the book of Acts, but it would certainly seem appropriate. It seems to me if you look back up to Acts 16, verses 35 to 40, you you notice there that Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they they didn't leave Philippi with their tails between their legs. Uh, They left at their own pace. They said goodbye to their brothers and sisters, and they were escorted out of the city by the governing authorities. I think one way to describe singing praises to God in prison after being beaten and fastened in stocks, you might call that absurdly happy, praising God. And of course, I think we've noticed throughout our study of the book of Acts that everywhere these early Christians go, trouble seems to follow them. Uh, We saw it in the beginning when the church was established in Jerusalem, and it's continued wherever the gospel has invaded new towns, cities, or regions. And so it should be no surprise that when they come to Thessalonica, it follows them. Wherever they go, conflicts erupt. Angry crowds form. Accusations are made. Punishments are inflicted. And so here they are in Thessalonica, and now what happens? They're they're described here as men who have turned the world upside down. And in order to understand our passage for today, we need to know that that word there, turned, means to disturb. It means to cause trouble, uh, to agitate. And when it's used in political contexts, as it is here, it can specifically refer to inciting sedition. That is to say, uh, it speaks of a revolt against the government to try to overthrow their authority, which means, of course, that this is quite a serious charge uh, that these men are bringing against Paul and these other Christians. And of course, the question for us is, is that true? Uh, Is that what Paul and Silas were actually doing? And if it is, then we should ask, well, if that's the case, then is that what Christians are supposed to do today? Is it, is it our calling to upset the peace and good order of society? Is that our call as Christians? Are we to directly challenge the authority of the government? 
Uh, we'll address those questions as we make our way through the passage. But if you were here last week, you remember that one of the things I said was that we're not to court trouble. Uh, Christians aren't to seek to provoke the governing authorities. And I stand by those statements. I think that's true. However, church, we do need to know this. Uh, the reality is that when we clearly proclaim the gospel in a world that finds its peace and security in things other than God, uh, in a world that lives in defiance of God and his authority, when we clearly proclaim the gospel, there's going to be agitation. Uh, the gospel will be seen as a threat to the order of things, both at the individual level and at, at the societal level. And no doubt many of us here uh, in the room can testify to that because that's our story. Uh, many of you, just like me, you, uh, you were just going about your business, living your life. Uh, you weren't what we would call today a seeker, right? You weren't, you weren't trying to become a Christian. You weren't, you weren't uh, trying to understand spiritual things. Uh, as you contemplated your, your future life, you, you never thought that reading the Bible or attending church on a regular basis would be a part of your future. Uh, you weren't curious about spiritual things. You, you were doing just fine. But then, as you were living your life, you were confronted by the claims of the gospel. You heard that the truth of the matter is that you are a sinner who has lived in rebellion against God. And one sin is enough to condemn us to hell for all eternity. But Jesus came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. And he rose again. He ascended into heaven where he now sits at the highest place of all authority. And he says one day he's going to come back and he will judge all people. You heard that message and it disturbed you. You, you knew that if it was really true, it would necessarily turn your life upside down, that everything would have to change, that Jesus wouldn't just be a peripheral concern. Uh, he, he would have to be, because of who he is, uh, the center and circumference of your life. Because the message of the gospel doesn't allow us, you understand that? It doesn't allow us to just tack it on to our lives and go on with business as usual. And the reason for that is because Jesus is a life-disrupting Savior. And that on at least three counts. Count one, because his claims are intrusive. Have you noticed that? Uh, Jesus claims to have a right to your life and every aspect of your life. You understand that? Uh, Jesus says there's actually no part of your life that's off limits. That's count one. Count two, because his lordship is comprehensive. Jesus says, I am Lord over heaven and earth. I'm the supreme ruler. There is no one else. I have absolute authority. And he says to us, you are not your own. So can you see how that would be disturbing? That's, that's disruptive, if that's really true. And count number three, he's a life-disrupting savior because <laughs> his work is invasive. I don't know if you know this or not, but when Jesus shows up, he comes to take over. Uh, Jesus is a jealous lover. He insists on being number one in your life, and he doesn't share his throne. Now, at first blush, even as you hear that, some of you sitting here might, might be getting a little antsy. I mean, this is disturbing, if this is really true. So what I want us to ask this morning is, what makes the gospel such disturbingly good news? What makes it such disturbingly good news? What I hope to show us this morning is that the message of the gospel disturbs us in order to lead us into a life of true and lasting peace. So we want to look at three disturbing claims of the gospel from this passage. Here's disturbing claim number one. It was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to die, and to rise from the dead. As we come out of chapter 16 and come into chapter 17, we see once again Paul and the missionary team, they, they're making a three-day journey about 100 miles southwest from Philippi, and they come to Thessalonica. And unlike Philippi, uh, Thessalonica has a Jewish synagogue. And so Luke tells us in verses 2 and 3 that over a period of three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. Why, why is that such a disturbing claim? Well, you need to remember that the title Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew title, Messiah. And at its most basic level, this refers to someone who's been anointed, 
someone who's been chosen or set apart by God for a purpose. And as it relates to the people of Israel, um, throughout their history, particularly through the preaching of the prophets, the expectation that developed was a hope for one who would come as God's anointed, as God's Christ. And he would redeem Israel from all of their enemies. He would rule over them as the appointed king, and he would establish justice in the land, and he would restore the rule and throne of David that had fallen. That, that, that was their hope. But the hope developed in a way that was not in line with God's word. The, the popular hope for the Christ had become one of worldly power and nationalistic glory. And here's the thing. With hopes that were shaped by those expectations and desires, who would want to follow a Messiah that was humiliated and condemned? One who suffered and died like the worst of criminals. I mean, doesn't that get things upside down? Uh, certainly the promised deliverer should come with strength and might and power and glory, and he, and, and he should lead us as his people in the same way. And so the Jews, they're saying to Paul and the team here, you want us to honor and trust a suffering Messiah as our king? I mean, that's disturbing. And, and they would be saying, and beyond that, Paul, you claim that he's risen from the dead? Uh, I mean, they, they would essentially be looking around saying to Paul, well, we don't see him on the throne of David. Uh, we're not restored to the land of, of promise. So show us this king. And Paul might say, well, he's reigning in heaven. He's been exalted to, to the highest place of authority. And they might respond by saying, well, well, Paul, frankly, we'd just rather stick with Caesar and the peace that we now have with the Roman emperor. And speaking of Rome, if you want to get a feel for how they saw these early Christians, you need to look no further than a, a piece of graffiti that archaeologists uncovered in a guardhouse wall in Rome. This is, this is it. It might be a little difficult to see what this is. But if you look closely, it's an image of a figure on the cross. But can you tell that the figure has the head of a mule? And written on the side is, Alexamenos worships his God. This is how the early Christians were seen by the surrounding community. They have Alexamenos bowing down on his knees, worshiping Christ. But you notice it's the head of a donkey. That's, that's how they saw Christians. Christians worshiped a mule. We need to know that, church, and we need to own it. That's how we're seen. Christians were not cool. They did not fit in. They were mocked, ridiculed, and made fun of. So whether we're talking about Jews, Greeks, or the Romans, their response to Christians and the message they proclaimed was, stop causing trouble. Stop it with your claims of your so-called Christ. But the Christians responded with the words of Peter in the book of Acts. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Or with Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Woe unto me. He pronounces a curse on himself. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Or as the prophet Jeremiah would say, it's like a fire in my bones. I can't keep it in. Now, why was it necessary for the Christ to suffer and to die and rise? Let's consider two reasons. First of all, to fulfill the scriptures. Look at verse 2. Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. What, what Paul wants them to see is that the Old Testament scriptures that they cherish actually reveal that the Messiah is the suffering servant king whose triumph was in his crucifixion. And you have to understand that that is a disturbing claim. It's a paradoxical claim of the gospel. The Christians were saying the cross was not a defeat. It was a victory. That's why I'll keep reciting for us the lyrics to that old hymn because it gets it so perfectly. By weakness and defeat, he won the glorious crown trod all his foes beneath his feet. How? By being trodden down. That's how he won. Now, exactly what Old Testament texts Paul led them through, we don't know, but if the sermons in the book of Acts that we've already studied before are any indication, I think we can say at least several texts. One, of course, would be Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, yet, here's how it wasn't, listen, it wasn't a defeat. It was the will of Yahweh to crush him. This was the father's plan. He, was, he has put him to grief. The father put the son to grief. He shall see his offspring. This is the resurrection. Christ, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. There's justification. And he shall bear their iniquities. There's substitution. Or, he may have taken them to Psalm 2. The nations raged against the Messiah. They, they opposed his anointed one, but Yahweh vindicated him. Psalm 16, God promised that his Holy One would not see corruption. Psalm 110, where David refers to the, the future Messiah as my Lord. And he says that this one who is his Lord is the king, but not just over Israel, over the entire world. So, so you see what Paul is doing here. What he's showing the Jews and others who were gathered on that day is what we need to understand. It is the storyline of Scripture. Many Christians know the stories of the Bible, but they don't know the storyline of the Bible. The one story of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. And this storyline proves that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. That's what he wants them to see, that it was in fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies and all the types and shadows in the Old Testament. The, the necessity of laying out what the Bible teaches explains why Luke holds up the Bereans to us as examples for us to follow. Why, why were these Bereans more noble than the Thessalonians? Not because the, the Bereans were partially depraved and the Thessalonians were totally depraved. That's not the point. It's not that they were more noble, that they were in the sense of uh, more nobly inclined or disposed to receive the truth. No. Their nobility is seen in their willingness to carefully and eagerly examine the scriptures. Which is why in verse 12, he connects that willingness to their belief. Look at it, verse 12. Many of them therefore believed. Right? In other words, the grace of understanding came through thinking as opposed to not thinking. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we're glad you're here. Uh, we would always invite you back and welcome your questions. But if you're hearing what we're talking about this morning and you find this disturbing, uh, paradigm shifting, I wonder if you'd be willing to read the scriptures. God wrote down his own word and promises. And he shows us that they all point to what he's done in the Messiah. So go to the source, read, read the Bible, examine it. And you'll see that his word tells us that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to die and to rise again. But there's more. Here's a second reason. We see here that it was necessary because of fallen humanity's plight. The whole Bible makes this point. What I mean is this, that the necessity of Christ's death and resurrection reveals our greatest need. What was that need? We saw it last week. Freedom from condemnation. Our need was greater than we realized. Paul wanted to convince the people he was reasoning with over three Sabbaths that their need was greater than just freedom from political oppression. They needed one who would deliver them from their sin and rebellion and the death and condemnation that would result because of it. Whether we're in the first century or the 21st century, politically speaking, we all know that's not a popular message. Here's, here's the message that resonates with us. All of your problems are outside of you. The reason for all of your difficulties are because you have people in your life that just make your life difficult. Your, your problems are all outside of you. They're external to you. But the gospel tells us that our fundamental problem is, is actually right here. Our problem isn't the people in our lives that make it difficult. Our problem is our own 
corrupt heart. We face oppression and external afflictions. Obviously, many of them are unjust, but we respond to them wrongly because our worldviews are distorted. That's why it was necessary for the Christ to die as a sacrifice and to rise again, demonstrating that he truly had conquered sin and death and he had the authority to forgive sins. But here's the thing, if that's true, then that upends everything. It's disturbing because of what it means. It means that if Christ didn't come to earth and he didn't live a sinless life, he didn't die a substitutionary death, he didn't rise again, then, that, then what that would mean is that we can't be saved and we would rightly be condemned. And yet, it's that disturbing message that we have to embrace, that we must embrace if we're to be forgiven and experience resurrection life with Christ. If you don't embrace that initially disturbing message, then you won't be led to true peace and lasting hope. So that's the first disturbing claim of the gospel. It was necessary. That may not hit us hard, but I can assure you in the first century, these Jewish people that Paul's reasoning with, it's a disturbing claim. Here's the second disturbing claim. Jesus suffered, died, and rose again. Therefore, he is the Christ. So put it together. He's saying it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and die and rise, which is what the scriptures said would happen. The depth of our depravity demanded it. And so Paul says to to the people, here's the good news. Jesus did that. Look at the end of verse 3. This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. He's letting everyone know the promised anointed Savior has come. This is essential to the gospel message. And if you've read the Bible, you know that that is a disturbing claim. That the 12 disciples and the earliest Christians were wrestling with. If you you read the gospels, you'll see that they they were often confused about and hesitant to accept and embrace that claim. The idea that people in the first century were just more gullible and more inclined to accept this is wrongheaded. They knew that people didn't just rise from the dead. This is why, after the women found the empty tomb and reported it to the 12 disciples, here's what we read in Luke 24, 11. But these words seemed to them, the 12 disciples, an idle tale, and they did not believe them. You got that? The 12 disciples did not believe what the women told them. Or, that's why Thomas declared confidently, right? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, he says confidently, I will never believe. Never. That's what scandalized Paul so much. How how scandalized was the man we call the Apostle Paul? He was so scandalized that he was willing to travel great distances and kill anyone who believed it. So put all this together, church, it's quite astounding. Even though God's word proclaimed that this is exactly what the Messiah would do, and even though the Messiah Jesus, when he came to earth, predicted his death and resurrection on at least three occasions... And then he accomplished it, and he rose from the dead, and guess what? The people still couldn't believe. And these were Jewish people who believed in God, who believed in the miraculous, and who actually believed in a future resurrection that was coming. And yet, when Jesus did it, they didn't embrace it. Why? Because it didn't fit in their framework until they saw the resurrected Christ. It was that undeniable reality that he was alive. They saw him. They walked with him. They ate with him. They, they touched him. And so the, the, the message that Paul once would have been willing to travel great distances and kill people if they believed it, he went on to say, no, this is the message now of first importance. He says, I delivered to you, 1 Corinthians 15, as of first importance, what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And let me remind you, the scriptures Paul's referring to there are the Old Testament. So that's the message that they proclaimed. It upended their lives so much so that they were willing to endure any amount of trouble to proclaim it. Their lives were turned upside down by a reality and a hope and a joy that was so glorious and so wonderful that they almost couldn't believe it but they just couldn't deny it. Which meant, what? That they could not continue on with life as usual. Everything had to change. But here's the thing, church. What do we see? With the message that they proclaim, it is so shocking that when you proclaim it, 
people get angry. They're, they're agitated. Why? Why do we get agitated? Whether in the first century or 21st century, why do people get agitated by the claims of the gospel? It tells us something about the human heart, church. Listen. Because we would rather live in the comfort of our false peace. We would actually prefer to live a lie. We would prefer to live an illusion. Why? Because it's more comfortable. The message of the gospel disturbs our false peace in order to lead us into a life of true and lasting peace. That's why, no doubt, some of you here right now, as I'm preaching and I'm saying these things, the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind areas in your life that you are holding on to that you know you need to let go of. You, there's things that you know you need to stop doing. But you're afraid because you know that if you truly embrace the implications of the gospel, it would mean cutting off a relationship. It might bring conflict into your family. It might result in a financial loss. It might involve you uh, giving up a dream that you've been holding on to. It might involve extending forgiveness to someone. The possibilities are endless. But the point is, all of those things that you know that you would have to do, they're uncomfortable. And so, Satan will suggest things like, why rock the boat? I mean, your life is comfortable right now. So, you know what you're supposed to do, but you hesitate because you can't control the outcome. And so, uh, holding on to the status quo is just comfortable. It's predictable, right? At least you know what you're going to get. And so we talk ourselves out of obedience. We wouldn't phrase it this way, but here's what's really happening. We love our idols. As I said last week, quoting Scotty Smith, idols always topple begrudgingly. You're going to find that your false gods won't go down without a fight. But we need to be willing to follow Jesus and say to him, I'm going to follow you no matter what, even though I don't know how this is going to turn out. That's called walking by faith and not by sight. And it's worth it. So what are the disturbing claims of the gospel? First, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. Secondly, Jesus died and rose again. Therefore, he is the Christ. And thirdly, the risen Christ is king over all. So after teaching and discussing Christ in the synagogue over three Sabbaths, we find once again what we've seen before. What, what happens? There's a division that takes place. Look at verses 4 and 12. Some were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. And if you look at verse 4 and 12, you'll notice both of those verses give us a snapshot of how the gospel reaches all kinds of people. It's a snapshot of the early church. What, what was it like? It's made up of Jews, Gentiles, women, men. Previous chapters would tell us jailers and merchants, lame beggars, the socially powerful and the socially ostracized. The gospel is for everyone. It's made up of all kinds of people in the church. But, verse 5, some Jews were jealous. Why are they jealous? Probably because they wanted to reach these people with their message. But now that they're leaving with Paul and the other missionaries, uh, they're, they're angry. But you'll notice, what, what, what do these Jews do? What we're told here, they don't try to refute Paul. They resort to violence. And notice what they do here. They accuse the Christians of doing what they're actually guilty of. They disturb, they, they say the Christians are guilty of disturbing the peace when in reality they're the ones creating the uproar. So what do they, they want to arrest Paul, but he's, he's not there. So they attack Jason, the man caring for Paul and his fellow travelers, the man who may have been allowing his house to be used for the, the church meetings. But notice in verses six and seven what their charge is. They say, these men are acting against the decrees of Caesar. And they say that there's another king, Jesus. They're charging them with being political revolutionaries. And that's what brings us to the question we raised earlier. The question is, is that, is that true? And if so, is that what Christians should be doing today, right? Is, is the goal of Christianity political revolution? The answer, of course, is it depends on what you mean. If you're asking, is it our goal as Christians to reject and overthrow 
legitimate authority of human governments? Well, then the answer is no. The Bible affirms the legitimacy of human governments and actually calls Christians to submit to the government. Here's just a sampling. Romans 13.1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. There's 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And just to state the obvious, if you know anything about the first century, uh, when those words were written, um, those weren't Christian governments we were talking about. And yet, Christians were called to submit to the governing authorities, and even, according to Romans 13, 7, to pay taxes to them. So all that to say, the charge here in this passage, the way it's intended, is not true. It, it, it was not the goal of these early Christians to depose Caesar. And yet, the claim of the gospel is that Jesus is king. He's king over the earth and therefore over every human government. Which means that the Christ, the divine son of God, demands allegiance from everyone and there's no exceptions. Which is why Peter specifies we're subject to the governing authorities for the Lord's sake. It expresses our supreme submission to Christ as we live in this world as representatives of his eternal kingdom. And we know one day that eternal kingdom will be revealed in the future where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The question is, is that, is that a political claim? Ultimately, yes, it is. And so that means wherever the government uh, ruler would seek to require us to live in disobedience to Christ our King, we, we must maintain our primary allegiance to Christ which is why Christians in the Roman government were killed. They would honor the emperor, but they would not worship the emperor. What does that mean for us today? Today, when we proclaim Christ as king, as citizens of the United States, uh, we're not defying the supremacy or worship of Caesar in the sense that we don't practice emperor worship, but it's still worth asking, when we proclaim Christ as king, whose supremacy are we challenging? Who or what challenges the supremacy of Christ's kingship in our own day? We could answer that in a number of ways. You may have some answers coming to mind, but I have to go back to what I said last week. I believe that in our culture, we are challenging the supremacy of the self. What do I mean? I mean the defiant attitude that says, I decide my identity. I decide my gender. I decide what to do with my body. I decide what brings me happiness. I decide what is right and wrong for me. I am my own sovereign. Maybe we wouldn't use this language, but what are we saying? I am my own God. There is no other king. There is no other authority higher than me. That's the primary king in the United States. And so what happens? What, what do we hear from the culture? We hear, don't tell me, Christian, don't tell me that I have to submit my identity, my gender, my definition of family, my happiness, my understanding of right and wrong to the authority of another. But here's what we say. That is what we proclaim. And when we proclaim that message, what happens? There's going to be anger. There's going to be agitation. Why? Because anger is a response to what we believe is unjust. And people believe it is unjust for you to tell them there's another king. There's another one who has ultimate authority. This is why, church, I've said it multiple times. I'll keep saying it. This is why, going all the way back to the first century, Christians were viewed as bad citizens. The Romans accused Christians, this is a direct quote, of hatred of the human race. Why? 
because they dared to say that their loyalty to Christ was greater than their loyalty to the state. And another first century document known as the Epistle to Diognetus, we don't know who the author is, but he wrote these words. He said, the world hates Christians because they set themselves against its pleasures. You hear that? The world, the first century world, they hate Christians because they set themselves against its pleasures. Because they won't just go along with us, they hate the human race. Why? Because they said, there's another king, there's another Lord, and it's not you, and it's not me. It is. Here's the disturbing claim once again. Who is the king? It's the crucified and risen Son of God. And he has a rightful claim over everyone and over every aspect of their lives. That's why I put that quote on the top of your bulletin from Frederick Buechner when he said, uh, you understand this? Uh, For a Christian, there is no such thing as your own business. There's no aspect of your life that he doesn't say, I own. And you see, here's the paradox of the gospel. We Christians dare to say, that is a wonderfully liberating message. That's a liberating message. The eternal king has given his life to save us from the foolish rebellion of trying to live as the sovereign of our own lives. Do you get that? When you you see it, it really is truly amazing. Jesus loves us enough to insert himself between us and our headlong rush into self-destruction and ultimate eternal condemnation. Jesus will get himself in the middle of it but giving up lordship of our own lives and surrendering to the lordship of Jesus, it feels like an upsetting thing. Listen to these words from the Lord Jesus. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 35. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. That sounds to me like a world turned upside down. But it's a world of everlasting joy and peace and stability and life. How do you find true life? Jesus says, you have to be willing to lose it and give it to me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this liberating truth that you are king. May we say with the poet John Donne, take me to you, imprison me, for except and unless you enthrall me, we shall never be free. Lord, may we find it to be the path to true freedom, to be your slaves. May we find it a joyful declaration to say that we are not our own. And may we find it, may you give us a distaste for trying to be Lord over our own lives. May we find living for ourselves to be enslavement and service to you, our perfect freedom. Lord, that's a big request. We bring big requests to you, our great King. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.